Good morning, everyone. Now, let's be honest. How many of y'all came thinking it was Sunday school hour? Raise your hand. Ah, so all of y'all set your clocks correctly. Is that right? I'm so proud of y'all. Y'all are doing awesome. So glad that you're here today. If you're worshiping with us online or in person, if you're visiting with us, we consider you an honored guest this morning. Thanks so much uh, for being here. Had a good crowd in our early service this morning at 9 over in the gym, and uh, it's good to see everybody here this morning as well. So let me share some announcements with you so you know what's going on in the life of the church. And while I do that, there's red pew pads on the end of each row. That's how we register our attendance. Uh, and if you would, please fill that out, pass it down to your neighbor so everybody in your row has a chance to, uh, to give registration. Uh, we've got a couple of meetings coming up this week. Uh, tomorrow night at 6 p.m. we have a board of stewards meeting. So if you are on our board of stewards, please take note. Uh, we'll meet in Harper Hall at 6 p.m. And on Tuesday, uh, we'll have our nominations meeting. Uh, that'll also be at 6 p.m. in Harper Hall. Those, that meeting, uh, both of those meetings actually help us to prepare for our church conference that's coming up in December, which is our one big business meeting of the year where we, we uh, uh, nominate our, our, our vote on our, our slate of officers for the new year, uh, set pastor salary, and, and some other things like that. So uh, Brian Harkness, who's a pastor over at Chandler, is going to be coming and leading us in that. Uh, and I go actually over to his church this afternoon, and I'll lead his church conference over in Chandler this afternoon. Also, uh, I want to let you know, next Sunday is our Commitment Sunday. As you know, we've been in our stewardship campaign, and uh, you hopefully by now have received either in the mail or by email a, uh, a letter that has links, or has also includes, if it's on snail mail, uh, a uh, commitment card, which is our estimate of giving card. Uh, and uh, hopefully you are, have that and either printed it off or have it in hand and begin today praying uh, about how God may be calling you to give uh, for the church's ministries and, and for supporting of those ministries in the new year. And you'll hear a little bit more uh, about that here a little bit later on from Diane as she comes to give our stewardship mom moment uh, here in just a little while. Uh, let's see, November Mission Barrel, we're collecting wrapping paper and gift bags. This goes along with our children's Christmas market. Uh, so if you have some of that out, or you are out and about and pick something up, drop it off in one of our yellow mission barrels. Potluck with a Purpose is uh, this Wednesday, November the 8th, 5.30. Hey, I'd rather hear a crying baby in church than no babies in church. I'll tell you that right now. Amen? Amen. All right. Uh, I got good lungs, too. I can preach loud. It's okay, all right? Okay, all right. So, uh, potluck with a purpose, Wednesday, November 8th at 530. Bring, bring, bring a dish to share. And then uh, the, the, the food items that we're collecting from the Mission House are holiday baking items uh, that can be donated. So, uh, bingo day. We're going to play bingo on, on Veterans Day, November the 11th in Fame Life Center. So, so, bring your friends and family. That'll be a fun time of fellowship. Children's Ministry Bake Sale going on uh, November 12th. Outreach Ministry Meeting, uh, how can we reach out into our community better? November 13th, 6 o'clock to 7. We've got a new Bible study uh, being started up by Sherry Henry on the, uh, the good news covering the Gospels. Uh, it's a six-week study. There's, if you want more information about that, it's in the bulletin as well. We've got a group going to the East Texas Food Bank to serve on Tuesday, November 14th. And then on Sunday, November 26th, we've got our, uh, our blood drive coming up as well. So please be aware of all these. These are all in your bulletin, so sure, be sure to pick one of these up and take it with you. Today is a uh, communion Sunday for us. Uh, everyone is welcome to uh, participate in, in communion. You will be led by the ushers uh, to come down the center aisle and kneel at the altar a little bit later on in the service. And you'll be given uh, bread and then a cup of grape juice uh, and uh, you'll partake that there, and then when you're finished, you just make your way back to your, your seats. So uh, if you're visiting with us, please know you're welcome to come and attend uh, in Holy Communion. It's, it's not the, a Methodist table or a Baptist table or a Lutheran table. It's the Lord's table, and the Lord invites all who would earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with God and one another to experience Him in a very real way today. So you are welcome to participate. All right, I think that covers everything. Uh, at this time, I invite you to stand, and let's greet one another in the name of the Lord.
remain standing for our call to worship. Our call to worship this morning is uh, a simple one. Uh, your, your response each time will be, His love endures forever. This comes from Psalm 107, verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. You may be seated as we prepare our hearts for worship. Will you stand with me, please, as we sing the God of Abraham praise? <clears throat> be seated for children's time. Good morning. I need some more of you. Come on up. I need some readers up here. I might need to get some bigger kids. Carly, will you come join us? Come on. Thank you, Carly. I knew you'd be a good sport about it. She's our tallest child yet. Have you all ever felt discouraged? Yeah? Sometimes things happen and we get discouraged. Let's just say like at school, 
Carly, maybe you've had a test that you didn't do so great on. Mm -hmm. Felt a little discouraged. Has that happened recently? Not recently. Oh, good. Yay. Last year. Last year, okay. Sometimes that can really be discouraging when we don't do as well as we expect. Or maybe we did a science project and we got up in front of the class and the project just kind of fell apart and everybody started laughing at us and saying, you're so dumb, what a stupid idea you had. That doesn't feel very good, does it? No, it doesn't. Well, our Bible verse today comes from 1 Thessalonians, and it says, You know that we treated each of you as a father treats his own children. We strengthened you, we comforted you, and we told you to live good lives for God. So what does that mean when someone strengthens us, comforts us, and, and helps us? What's another word for that? encourage. That's the opposite of discourage. When we encourage people, we say words to them that make them feel better, especially when they are having a hard time. Now, I'm going to give you all um, something to read. I'm going to hold the microphone for you, and you're going to read it. Let's pass some of these out, though. Can all of you read? Yes? No, ah, come on. Here you go. You can do that one. You're going to do this one. And after you read it, I want you to hold your sign up so that people can see it. I might have to have you do two. You want to do two? All right. All right. So once you, when you read it, I want you to um, hold your sign up after you're done. Okay. What's your say? You got this. I can help you. Great work. Awesome. I'm proud of you and don't give up. Awesome. I love you. Very good. You can do it. All right. These are great ways that we can make someone feel better and encourage them when they've had a hard time, right? Right, congregation? You guys can use those words to each other, too, all right? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he encourages us. Thank you he is there for us. Thank you we can depend on him. Help us to encourage one another. And give hugs where they're needed. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. My name is Diane Fritchie, and I've been asked to talk to you for just a couple of minutes about stewardship. Isaiah 43, 19, for I am about to do something new. When we join this church, we agree to give our prayers, our presence, our service, our witness, and our gifts. So during this time of stewardship, we focus on the gifts, which includes time and money. As Christians, we are called to give God our best. So this time of stewardship, we focus on giving our first fruits, our very best, back to God the Father. If you're visiting with us and you've been here for a couple of Sundays, I know that you're thinking that church only talks about money. I want to assure you that's not the truth. We only talk about money once a year during the stewardship campaign, and there's a reason uh, for that. We want to remind you that we are to commit our gifts to God, and we want to remind you that there is a biblical truth for Christians <coughs> about giving. More importantly, we want to be able to plan our, not more importantly, we also want to be able to plan our next year, not more importantly. 
than giving your gifts and your first fruits to God. But we do want to be able to plan our next year because um, we do have a budget. We abide by that budget. I can assure you that every penny is accounted for. I can assure you that every penny that is spent is approved prior to spending. You will find an accounting, an overview of accounting in our monthly newsletter. Our board of stewards every month gets a detailed accounting of that money. When I was growing up and the tithing sermon came around, I remember some of the older folks would say, oh, I don't have to do that, God will provide. But I think that they forgot the salient point. You see, God had created them for a specific work and a specific purpose in his church. And he wanted to work through them because without them, he couldn't work in that church. And so it is true for us. God has put us in this place, in this time, at this particular moment to give back to him to give our gifts, to give our time, to give our prayers, our presence, our talents for his work. For I'm about to do something new. Do you know what the rest of that verse says? It says, see, I have already begun. Do you not see it? So we have assurance that God is already in this place. He's already begun a new thing in each of us for his purpose, so that we can further his kingdom. If you've never given money to the church, this would be the time that I would encourage you to start, no matter how small, and to see what God will create new through you. If you are giving but you've not achieved the 10% tithe, I would encourage you to give a little more this year and see what God will do new through you. And if you are tithing, I would just ask you to consider something over and above an offering and dedicate it to a special mission that's important to you. Here at uh, Bullard Methodist, we make it very easy for you to give. You can give every Sunday like my husband David and I do because we wouldn't remember otherwise. And it is sort of our act of worship when we do that every Sunday. You can bring it to the church office, you can mail it to the church office, or you can use our website for online giving. When you go to BullardMethodist.org, there is a block at the top and it says give. And if you hit on give, there's a drop down menu. It will take you to the website where you can establish your online giving. You can do it one time. You can do it on a recurring basis. You can have it pulled from a credit card, from a debit card, or from your checking account, whatever you choose. Um, there were also there is a link for our estimate of giving card. If you hit that link, it will take you right to an online form that you can fill out and submit. Or next Sunday, we will have the opportunity if you prefer, as uh, Pastor David said earlier, to um, print it off and pray over that this week, you can bring it back here next Sunday and then put it in the offering plate. So I want to encourage you that the estimate of giving is just what it says. It's just an estimate. And life happens. And so if life happens and you can't meet that estimate, there is no condemnation here. But I also want to impress upon you that that um, estimate is very important to our finance team. Because without the estimate, they're giving a stab in the dark as to the annual budget. But with the estimate, they're giving an educational projection. As we enter this time of reflection this week, I just respectfully ask that you open your hearts to God and see how he's moving for he is about to do something new. See, he's already working among us. Thank you. Please stand and join me in our affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. If you'll please remain standing with me as we sing How Firm a Foundation. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? Fear not, I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God, and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen and help thee, and cause thee to stand, upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. The soul that on Jesus still leans for repose, I will not, I will not desert to its foes, that so through all hell should endeavor to shake. I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Please remain standing. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for all the gifts you have given us, our lives, our loved ones, all that we have and all that we are. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus, your Son and our Redeemer, who came among us to show us the way to eternal life. Jesus was the perfect steward of your gifts, showing that complete trust in you is necessary and that giving of self is a most important part of following him. May the offerings of our time, our talents, and our material resources be made in the same spirit of sacrifice that Jesus taught us by his life and death for us. Amen.
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Please remain standing. Our scripture reading this morning is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 13. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And we also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this day, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen? I feel contractually obligated to, to let our visitors know today that uh, if you're not a regular here, I'm known for my bad jokes, okay? I just want to go ahead and just put that right out there in front of you, I, I, and, and, and today is no different. Uh, a gentleman was walking into his church. He was going to see his pastor, and he had to go through several parts of the building there, and he was older gentleman. He walked with his back all bent over and had a cane, and he made his way through the sanctuary foyer, and, and then he made his way through the fellowship hall, and then he made his way into the preacher's office and several people were there working on some different things getting ready for projects having studies whatever and they saw this gentleman from their church make his way as as he does hobbled over uh, with a cane they watched him go in the preacher's office and he stayed in there a little while and eventually he came out but this time he was walking all upright and looking around and seeing everybody and he said hello to a few people and everything finally one of the person stopped him and said this is a miracle that's taken place i cannot believe it you walked into the preacher's office you were hobbled over uh and, and here you are all walking upright what's this is this is an amazing miracle and the guy says it's not a miracle the preacher just gave me a cane that wasn't six inches too short Hey, I got a better laugh out of them than I did the early service. That's pretty good. Okay. Extra hour of sleep does you good, doesn't it? Well, I'd like to tell you that it has something to do with the Scripture today, but it actually has nothing to do with the Scripture today. But you know me, I like to tell a good joke when I find one. In our sermon series on uh, 1 Thessalonians, uh, we have explored uh, what it looks like to live with eternity in mind. What difference does it matter that we are, we are not just here and die and are gone, but rather uh, we will live with eternity with God in the days to come? What does that matter for us in the here and now? What difference does it make knowing that we will live with God in eternity later? Well, previously in this message series over 1 Thessalonians, we talked about how living with eternity in mind helps us to prioritize things that that are most important to our lives. We talked about how living with eternity in mind gives us hope and, and better perspective for this life. We talked about how living with eternity in mind motivates us to, to live a life that is pleasing to God. And we talked about how uh, it helps us to be more compassionate and, and forgiving of others. And we also talked about how living with eternity in mind gives us a sense of purpose and meaning in this life and today as we continue this 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 theme if you will of living with eternity in mind we're going to focus on first thessalonians chapter two uh and uh, uh the, ver the passage was read for us but we're going to focus on two of the verses this morning we're going to focus on verse uh number 11 
and verse number 12. I want to read them for you. Just listen for them. They're not going to be on the screen. I just want you to listen for them. Verse 11 and 12 says this, For you know that we dealt with each other, uh, each of you, as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and his glory. The Apostle Paul uh, speaks to these young Christians in a, in a, in a young church uh, who are facing their own trials as, as young churches sometimes do. Uh, and he wants to say, listen, uh, we want to treat you like a father treats his children that he loves. And, and we want to encourage you. We, we want to comfort you. But all along, we want to urge you to live a life that gives glory to God. And so that's what I want to talk about this morning. The, ur- the encouraging, the comforting, and the urging of which Paul is speaking. The first part is encouragement we are called to be an encouraging people paul spoke of encouraging uh the thessalon the church at thessalonica you know we live in a chronically negative world the world around us everybody seems to to have woken up on the wrong side of the bed everybody's got something negative to say there are voices of discouragement all around us from other people from people at work, uh, from uh, the media, the, the world at large, even ourselves. We can, we can be our own worst critic. We can be our own worst naysayer, really just beating ourselves up. As if we have a, uh, you know, sometimes I, I want to tell people, listen, put the, put the emotional baseball bat down. You, you don't need to beat yourself up over things like you do. You know, we can be our own biggest discourager if if we allow ourselves to be you know discouragement starts early Uh, kids can be mean can't they Uh, kids can be cruel they can say things that that are really harmful they they can point out differences and make fun of them you know i remember being a little kid in 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 uh uh, in first grade uh we got picked because our school had been growing and uh we had they gotten a new kindergarten teacher and they announced this you're going to go to this new kindergarten teacher her name was mrs york and uh, she got introduced to the school she seemed really nice and and uh and i remember uh at thornton elementary school in temple texas we were the thornton thunderbirds uh and uh, i remember that that next year we were going to go out to they were bringing in new portable building classrooms y'all ever had to be in one of those uh and, and it had a little porch on it and i remember the first day of school Going up there, mom always set the clothes out for me, you know, you, she did that for all of us kids, you know, this is what you're wearing, so I just put on what she told me to put on, and, and for that first day of school, she had set out a, a little pair of brown sandals, and uh, here I was going to first grade, uh, wearing a pair of brown sandals that I had no clue that no other boy in first grade would dare wear, and sure enough, uh, I'm on the front porch uh, at that little portable building, waiting for Mrs. York to come unlock the door so we could go in. And all the other boys noticed my little brown sandals. And, uh, and guess what? Uh, they all said, what nice sandals you had. No, they, they didn't. They, they made fun of my sandals, and they made jokes about my sandals, and they embarrassed me. And, and I still remember that uh, like it was yesterday. Therapy's helping. Um, no, I'm kidding. I, I, that's neither here nor there. But what I'm saying is, I still remember that. I'm 53 years old. I can still remember harmful words discouraging words that were said to me even as a as a as a little boy and you think that when we grow up we become all become mature adults and all that goes away right Uh, we don't have this kind of discouragement we don't have this kind of criticalness we don't have this kind of negativity that's not true is it it's still there You, you go to work and that project you've been working on all week long gets presented and it's suddenly not good enough for the boss you're at home uh and and spouses can can be uh discouraging to one another your in-laws tell you uh uh, you're not raising the kids right and and then your kids turn around and agree with them (laughs) on social media we've got uh you know we see things that are discouraging people say negative things to one another we we see uh uh, a party that everybody else got invited to. Everybody's posting pictures about it except us. We didn't get invited, and that is discouraging to us. You know, we, 
we can get discouraged real easily in this world in which we live because life in general can be discouraging. Stories told of a former heavyweight boxer by the name of James Quick Tillis. Was, he was a cowboy turned boxer from, from Oklahoma. And uh, he, was, uh, he, he fought out in Chicago uh, in the early 1980s. And he still remembers his first day in the Windy City. He wrote about it. He wrote uh, that on the first day in the Windy City, he uh, got off the bus with two suitcases under his arms in downtown Chicago, and he stopped in front of the Sears Tower, and he set those bags down, and he looked up at the Sears Tower and was in awe and wonder of this giant building and skyscraper, and, and he looked down. Sure enough, both suitcases were gone. Life can be discouraging. In John 10, 10, Jesus tells us the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And I have come, Jesus said, that they might have life and have it to the full. Of course, we know the, the thief to be the, the devil, and he is the master of discouragement. He's always looking for ways to discourage us. John Lawrence, in his book called Down to Earth, tells the following story. He says, it was advertised one day that the devil was going to put up all of his tools for sale. Anybody who wanted to come could see them. He would put them out for display, and then people could bid on his tools. And so people came from far and wide, and they saw out on these tables the tools of the devil. One of them said hatred. Another one uh, said envy. Another one said jealousy. Another one said doubt. Another one said lying. Another one was pride, and so on and so forth. But, but off to the side, by itself, was this tool that had been looked that looked very well worn, as if it was worn down. And, and uh, it, it, it was a harmless looking tool, but it was well worn and pricey uh, compared to everything else. It, it, it was more expensive than all the other tools combined. And so finally, somebody came up to the devil and said, Devil, why is this one more pricey than, than all of the other ones? And the devil said, Well, it's because that tool is more useful to me than all those other tools combined. You see, with this tool, I can pry open and get inside a person's heart uh, in, in such a way that I can get near to them in ways that I can't get with all the other tools. And then once I'm inside, I can make him do or her do whatever I choose. It is a badly worn tool because I use it on almost everyone since few people know that it belongs to me the devil's tool was named discouragement the devil's price for this discouragement was so high that it never sold it is still his primary tool to this day and he still uses it on us as often as he can in a negative world People need an encouraging word. Would you say that with me? In a negative world, people need an encouraging word. Right up front, I want to tell you uh, that God is calling you to be an encourager. God needs you to encourage the people around you, to help lift them up, to help build them up, to help them to become the people that God desires them to be. Because they're living in a world, we're living in a world, that is constantly tearing us down, that is constantly being critical of us, that is constantly saying negative things to us. This world in which we live will, will tear a person to shreds. And this world needs people who won't do that. This world needs people who will encourage others in faith. Paul encouraged the Thessalonians uh, by reminding them of God's love and grace. He knew that they were facing persecution. He knew that they were facing challenges. But he wanted them to know God was with them and that God would sustain them in the midst of their trials. In the same way, God needs us to encourage others in their faith, to encourage people to come to faith in Christ, but also to encourage people in their faith in Christ. To encourage them in a way that, that helps them to overcome the, the darkness and despair of this world by sharing with them the hope of the gospel that we have in Jesus Christ. We must remind each other of God's love for us. We must remind each other that God has a plan for our lives. How do we do that? How do we 
encourage people in such a way that we have a mind to eternity. Well, we can speak, we can speak encouraging words of, of hope and life. We can pray for one another. We can serve one another in love. And we can celebrate one another's victories. Be the encouragers that God has called you to be. That's the first thing I want to talk to you about this morning. The second thing I want to talk to you about this morning is Paul's second word for us, and that word is comfort. John's uh, gospel in chapter 4 begins with Jesus comforting his disciples. He says in verse 1, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He then goes on to speak to them first of the promise of an eternal home. He says, My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and I will take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. Secondly, he speaks to them of the way to get to that new eternal home, and that is through him alone. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then finally, he speaks to them of the gift they would receive soon uh, from God, which would be for them, with them until the time, and with them into, the, into eternity as they wait for their eternal home. He says in verses 6 and 7, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. Something we need to understand at this point in John's Gospel was that the disciples had already begun to hear Jesus talk about what was to come. He had already begun talking to them about the fact that he must suffer and die. And they did not understand it, and they were confused by it. You see, they had had three wonderful years of ministry. They had seen his teaching, and they had seen his miracles. They had participated in feeding the 5,000 and the 4,000 and, and helping people with, that were sick. And, and they, were, they were amazed by all this. But then Jesus began talking about his impending betrayal and death. And it was all quite unsettling for them. And so what does Jesus do? He comforts his disciples. He says to them, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. And what does he do next? He then begins to talk to them about what's to come. He, and he, he, he comforts them in their, in their uh, points of, of confusion. He comforts them in, in their uh, concern for him. He comforts them in, in their, their wondering about what is happening next by telling them what's going to happen next. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and I will bring you to that place with me. God comforts his people by reminding them of what is to come. By speaking to them about the light of eternity, uh, about the fact that this world does not get the final say, that by the fact that, that, that there is something more than just what is here. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. You see, Paul also comforted the Thess Thessalonians, and he, he knew that they too were struggling with the world in which they lived and the trials that they were facing, and he wanted them to know that God, through the Holy Spirit, was their comforter and that he would give them strength and peace and purpose in the midst of what they faced. And Paul's words of comfort reminded them that this world was not all there was, that God was preparing a better place, a greater place, where this world does not get the final say on on where our struggles are, but rather God sends us into eternity. Paul's words of comfort reminded them that this world was not all there was. We too need to comfort one another in this way. We all go through difficult times. We all need someone to be there for us. We need someone to be not only the hands and feet of Christ, but also the ears of Christ, the shoulder of Christ, to be there to listen to someone when they are in pain or in hurting or confused or, or, or lost. We need to, to be the shoulder for them to cry on when they need somebody to comfort them, to be the arm to put around them, to be the person that points them to Jesus by acting like Jesus for them today and how we treat them. How can we comfort one another for eternity? Well, we can listen to one another without judgment. 
We can offer practical help and support. We can share our own testimonies of God's faithfulness in our lives. And we can pray for one another fervently. This leads us to our third point. Paul first said encourage. Paul second said comfort. And third, he talks about urging. Urging people to live a life that gives glory to God. Listen to what Paul says in in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. You know, uh, Tony Evans points out that during an election, people make it a point to declare who they stand for. They've got it on bumper stickers. They've got it on yard signs. They've got it on shirts. They've got it on hats. This is the person I stand for. This is the person that I'm voting for. There are also people during times of election who don't care or who are undecided. And you can't tell who they are supporting during that election year. Sadly, too many Christians, uh, spiritually speaking, fit into the latter category uh, when it comes to Jesus. The world just doesn't know where they stand. You may or may not know who that you may or may not know who they support politically, but nothing about them lets you know where they stand spiritually. There's simply not enough evidence to show they stand for Jesus. So what about you? If being a Christian was illegal and you were taken to court for it, would there be enough evidence to show that you were a follower of Jesus Christ? Or would there not be? Or let me say it another way. Do people know more about where you stand politically than where you stand spiritually? Folks, the Apostle Paul was exactly the opposite of that. No, he didn't have Jesus hats. He didn't have Jesus t-shirts or a Jesus flag outside of his home. But you knew where he stood for Jesus because he lived for Jesus. Paul was unashamed of who Jesus was and what Jesus did for us. And he wants us to be equally unashamed of Jesus. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Paul spoke those words boldly when he wrote them to the Roman Christians, and he wants us to live those words boldly in our lives. Paul also urged the Thessalonians to live lives worthy of the kingdom of God and for God's glory. He knew that they were called to be holy and a righteous people, and he wanted them to live in a way that would bring honor to God. And we as Christians need to urge other Christians to do the same. We need to do this lovingly. This is not about making other Christians feel guilty uh, so that they'll be bold in their faith. But rather, remember, this, this, pad, this verse starts off about we have loved you like a father loves a, a son or a father loves a daughter. And so in love, in, in encouraging ways, that we ought to urge one another to live boldly for Jesus Christ. To do this in a way so that others know that we stand for something and we're not falling for everything, but we're standing up for what we know to be right and know to be true and for the one who saves us to be bold in our faith when it comes to witnessing for who Jesus is in our lives. How do we do that? How do we urge one another with eternity in mind? Well, we can challenge one another in a loving way to grow in their faith. We can invite them to a Bible study with us. We can invite them to a Sunday school class with us. We can hold one another accountable in mutual accountability, joining together with another brother to another brother or another sister and a sister or maybe groups of people where they get together and say, you know what, we're going to meet weekly uh, and we're going to form a band meeting. And we've talked about those before in the past. It has a, there's an accountability list of questions that you can ask one another. I meet with a band of uh, preachers. There's four of us all together. We meet every Thursday at 9 o'clock by Zoom. And we hold each other accountable to our faith. We encourage each other. We urge each other to live boldly for Christ. If you want to do something like that and you've got a group of friends you want to do it with, let me know. I will help you set that up. We can also pray for one another's growth in the Lord. We can continue also to be good examples to one another. Paul encouraged, Paul comforted, and Paul urged. And Paul and God calls us to do the same. 
This world needs an encouraging word from us. This world needs comfort as we comfort one another. This world needs those that are going to live boldly for Christ. May we be these persons, encouragers, comforters, and those that urge others to go onward in Christ. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen? Amen. I invite you at this time to join me. You can either find it in your bulletin or, or uh, on the screens above as we join now into Holy Communion. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who truly love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, who dwell in charity with their neighbor and intend to live a holy life. Draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort, making your humble confession to Almighty God. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, we confess and lament that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We truly are sorry and humbly repent because the remembrance of our sin is more than we can bear. Have mercy on us and forgive us. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, Pardon us of all that is past and grant that we may ever serve you in newness of life to the glory of your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. On the night in which Christ gave himself up, he took bread gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which has been given for you. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, O Lord, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of salvation, O Lord, we give you thanks as we ask you to pour out your Spirit upon these gifts of bread and cup and allow them, O Lord, to be for us the body and the blood of Christ. By your Spirit, O Lord, make us one. One in mission and ministry to all the world until all the world comes to know the saving love of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The uh, plate out in the middle, for those of you who may not know, this is uh, for our Dollar Mission Club. If you'd like to drop a dollar in there, it'll go to the St. Paul's uh, Children's Foundation, a, a ministry uh, to needy children in uh, Tyler. Uh, they do medical care and dental care and other services for, for families and children in need. Uh, and all the monies from this quarter's uh, communion offerings will go towards that. Uh, if you don't have a dollar today, that's perfectly fine. It's the only give as you feel led to do so. Uh, at this time, I'm going to invite those who are going to be assisting with uh, communion today to come forward as we prepare to serve. Come as the ushers lead you.
been good to be together in the Lord's house this morning, partake in Holy Communion. Amen? Amen. Amen. At this time, I invite you to, uh, to stand and join me in our closing song this morning. If you are here this morning, God is moving your heart and life, and you're ready to profess your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're invited to do so by coming forward. If you've already done that uh, and you're interested in becoming a member, uh, I invite you to come meet with me this week or sometime soon, and we can talk about what membership is about and how you might get involved and plugged in that. Uh, we do have a, a couple that has done that this week, and they're going to be coming forward today to, uh, to uh, be received as, as members. Uh, we also uh, have uh, Debbie Monday, who was, who was received earlier uh, in my office as a member, and, so, uh, and I've got another couple that uh, has invited me to, to uh, meet with them later on this week. So uh, neat things are happening. Uh, God is doing some great things. So let's stand together as we sing Wonderful Words of Life. Uh, with me today is uh, is Myra and Floyd Leesburg, and uh, we met uh, in the office and talked about the mission and vision of this church and talked about ways that they could get plugged into that, and they now uh, have decided they, I, I let folks, if you want to join in the church office, you can do that, or you want to come forward, they decided they wanted to come forward to uh, profess their, their uh, membership today, and so uh, I ask you now before God and all these wonderful people, uh, will you be loyal to this Methodist church and uphold it with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? With that, I extend you the right hand of Christian fellowship and brotherly love and welcome you as the newest members of Bullard Methodist Church. Let's welcome them. And if you will agree to uh, stand alongside them and Debbie Monday as well and any other new members that come our way, uh, and to join them in fulfilling our mission uh, to be the church God has called us to be. Would you say amen? Amen. 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 I'm going to invite you to, if you want, you can grab your purse and whatnot, but uh, right back here behind the door there, uh, folks will want to, actually, let's do it out here. It's a little more room. Folks will want to shake your hand and welcome you uh, at membership, so you're welcome to go on back there if you'd like. So, thank you. All right. Would you receive now this, uh, this benediction? Go forth in the power and strength that God gives you to be the children of God. To lead lives that encourage others in their faith. That comfort others who are hurting. And who point others to Jesus. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Amen.